On this edition of One Plus One, Osama bin Laden has gone, but Al-Qaeda and political dissent thrives in his ancestral homeland of Yemen. We speak with writer Jill Jolliffe about her affection for East Timor and Alicia Martin on her struggle to eat healthy, affordable food. Hello, I'm Jane Hutchin. Welcome to the program. Dr. Sarah Phillips has spent almost four years living in Yemen, studying its winding path to state building before becoming an academic at the Centre for International Security Studies at Sydney University. She's one of the world's leading authorities on the politics, tribes and the growth of the Al-Qaeda movement in the Arabian Peninsula. It's not just this week's killing of Osama bin Laden that's raising concern in the region, it's the fragility of the 32-year-old regime of President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Sarah Phillips, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks. The US Defense Secretary Robert Gates has described the Yemeni branch of Al-Qaeda as perhaps the most dangerous. What does that exactly mean? Well, it's certainly one of the most ambitious franchise or branches um, operating at the moment. It's tried to assassinate the Deputy Minister of Interior within Saudi Arabia. It tried to conduct that infamous underpants bombing attack on the, on the flight to Detroit on Christmas Day. And then it tried to load printer uh, explosives into printer cartridges late last year. So they are trying to conduct ta attacks within the West. But to call it the most dangerous franchise, I think runs the risk of attributing to them a level of capacity that they don't necessarily have. They are dangerous, they do pose a threat, but we're not looking at an organisation that is fully formed um, in the way that bin Laden's network was in Afghanistan. So in terms of the death of Osama bin Laden, what impact does that have on al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula? I don't think it has a very big impact. They've been operating as their own branch or franchise for quite some time now. Um, they don't, uh, as far as I'm aware, they don't take um, direct orders from him, although there have, been, there have been communications and some people say that there have been some direct orders some time ago. Um, I think the important thing here is that this is a, a, a branch that has become fairly self-sustaining. It's not reliant upon the al-Qaeda core within Afghanistan or Pakistan. So his death isn't going to have an enormous impact. So what sustains the Yemeni branch of al-Qaeda? My view is that a lot of their power is gained by their ability to communicate and communicate with disenfranchised Muslims outside of Yemen. Uh, they've been certainly putting a lot more emphasis on that within the last, let's say, six months to a year. And I think that there's a chance, anyway, that this suggests that they feel concerned that perhaps they are being marginalised within Yemen because of um, security actions against them and because the tribes and a lot of the communities don't really want them around. What about the role of their head, who's uh, quite a good English speaking, I believe he's a cleric, Anwar al-Alaki. Uh, al how influential is he and, and how much charisma does he have? Anwar al-Awlaki is an interesting character. His real power is in his ability to, to use his, uh, his English language. He's a native English speaker to communicate he's with people. He's from the States, isn't he? He's, he's uh, American-born, yes. And so he is, he's a very good speaker. He, he really is very good at communicating with, with people and at selling the message that if you want to take part in jihad, you don't need to come to Yemen. This is something that you can do yourself. You can do this at home. You can make a bomb. You can make some explosives. And you've seen um, with, the, with the printer cartridge uh, attack, or the attempted attack, I should say, late last year, um, the addition of al-Qaeda's English language magazine that came out after that made a lot of the fact that this only cost $4,600. They were trying to put out the idea that anybody can do this. But to me, what that suggests is that they may be moving more from the bin Laden sort of a model within Afghanistan towards an anarchist sort of a movement, anarchist very much with the jihadi frame of reference, but a movement that is very decentralised and that relies on people's own initiatives. You say that in Yemen itself, al-Qaeda doesn't have that much of a support base. At the same time, Yemen in, is in the midst of widespread protests against the regime of President Ali Abdullah Saleh. 
The demonstrations don't, as you've said, don't have that much to do with al-Qaeda. So what is happening there at the moment? There's a tremendous amount of disaffection in Yemen, and the country has been miserably governed for quite a long time. And that is something that al-Qaeda has been quite good at tapping into. In their, some of their, particularly their Arabic language uh, material, they'll hone in on this narrative that the government has treated you unjustly, the government has stolen your money, the government has, um, has marginalised or has corrupted your tribal traditions. We won't do that. That's what al-Qaeda's been very good at. But what they're not good at is, is tapping into the emerging narrative coming out of the protests. The protests really have absolutely nothing to do with, with al-Qaeda and the message that it tries to put out. And you can see in the most recent edition of their English language magazine that they, they seem to be quite on the back foot about that. They're quite concerned that people are going to realise that they're not a part of this. And so they're trying to say that they are. They're trying to say that um, the protesters are doing their work for them. The problem that they face with that is that it's simply not true. And how committed has the president been? Do you see him being defeated by the current protests and the disaffection? Yes. I think it's almost impossible, if not impossible, that he can survive. He's, he's doing everything that he can. He's digging his heels in. He's promised to sign an agreement um, for which he'll step down within 30 days. Uh, he was due to sign that over the weekend. He's since pulled back. He's said no, that he won't. So he's, he's, doing, he's going through a lot of the similar motions that we saw Hosni Mubarak go through. Um, he's really strongly in the denial stage, but he really doesn't have a whole lot of cards that he, remaining that he can play. How easy is it for a specialist like you to study Yemen and to follow events there when you're not allowed into the country? Well, initially, Yemen was just a great place to study. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. It's a wonderful place to live. Yemenis are great people. The problem is, is that as the political walls close in...